So I'm a senior scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Agri Canada. My focus of research is purely on beef cattle welfare. So we do everything from transport to uh, pain management, so pain uh, mitigation for castration, dehorning, tail docking, branding, those types of things. And we've done a lot of work on early detection of illness in beef cattle, feeding behavior. Um, so anything that helps industry with welfare issues, also public concerns about beef cattle welfare, we, we work on those and try and be very practical and relevant to the industry and to the public. Today's, I was invited to talk about our, all of our transport research work that we've done in Canada. We've been very lucky. I've been gotten quite a bit of funding from the Canadian beef industry. Um, it first started about 10 years ago when we initially put some studies in to look at what happens in terms of stress on the trailer for cattle and it actually turned into a benchmarking study. Uh, we, we stayed away from actually taking the physiological and behavioral measurements, um, but we started with a benchmarking study, just looking at the norms and extremes in the industry so we could get a handle on where things were going well and where things weren't going well and what we needed to focus on um, more detailed with our research. So as part of that, we were very lucky to work very closely with the industry and the transport companies uh, and we sat down and developed the survey together so the questions were relevant, um, the, the transporters and the producers knew what we were talking about and what we were asking for. We just wanted to keep it very simple and actually the information is very simple. We looked at things like uh, total distance traveled, amount of time on the trailer, loading densities, feed water and rest intervals, uh, injuries and poor animal welfare out outcomes when animals get off the trailer uh, and then the relationships of those things to um, things like the type of truck, the type of animal, the driver's experience. Um, so just to kind of um, look at risk factors and, and how those, what relationships those have to one another. The weather, the boarding pattern on the trailer, whether they use bedding, those types of things. And so um, we were very lucky to get a very large sample size. We uh, printed 10,000 surveys, so we s sent out 10,000 surveys and we broke them down into a long haul survey, which was over uh, 400 kilometers in miles. I don't have the number in my head. And then under 400 kilometers, uh, which was our short haul survey. So most of the data that I presented today was actually in our long haul survey. And so the main outcomes of, of those, the things that stick most in my mind about that study is actually the time on the trailer. So uh, time in transport. Our Canadian regulations indicate that animals can be on the trailer for up to 52 hours. And um, this study actually shows that there's some, the, the data shows that actually at about that 30 hour mark is where we start, start to see very, uh, the, the weight loss or the shrink plateaus. And so, some of my producers were saying, well, that's good, Karen, we can keep transporting those animals past that 30 hour mark, but that's not the message. The message is at that point, those animals have lost all of their water through urine and feces and respiration. And now you're looking at tissue loss. So my recommendation is to push that um, limit or, or line in the sand to about 20 to 24 hours uh, in transport. Um, we looked at things like more vulnerable, vulnerable parts of the population. So the calls, of course, we know this, it's, it's not a surprise, but it's just nice to put some numbers on it. We did see more poor welfare outcomes for those cull cows and even calves uh, based on the distance transported. So again, if we can keep those animals under that 30 hour or 24 hour mark, the better for them. And then uh, effects of temperature. So anytime the temperature became uh, less than minus 15 degrees Celsius or greater than 15 degrees Celsius, we saw increase in welfare issues, uh, poor welfare outcomes for all animal groups. Um, what else from the, the study? So we had, we looked at loading density as well. And from the loading density, we did see that again, um, I'm not gonna give you the numbers because it's a scientific calculation that might not mean anything to you but those values are any time the truck was severely underloaded or overloaded we saw greater uh, incidence of, of uh, poor welfare and what we mean by poor welfare the things that we could actually measure was animals that were lame dead down and then we had a, a combined called ca compromised cattle that combined all three of those things the time on the trailer and the temperature really matter and obviously the more um, 
vulnerable those cattle are. So when you're looking at calves and calls, those tend to be the populations that are most affected by longer distances, by higher temperatures, by greater loading densities or lower loading densities. So again, I don't think this is a surprise to the industry, but at least our, sh our study was able to put some numbers and values on it. And in terms of even in terms of loading density, what that looks like and what it should be so we can reduce those kind of poor welfare in outcomes. We've looked at many different indicators of welfare and stress. So both physiological and behavioral measurements are what we look at. Tends, the behavioral ones tend to be more telling than sometimes the physiological ones are. So we look at the stress hormone cortisol, we can look at heart rate, uh, we can look at um, uh, immune function, so white blood cell counts, those types of things and see how they can affect the cattle uh, once they get off the trailer and mostly we were looking at calves placed, fall calves placed in the feedlot after long transport but we actually saw very little evidence that um, at least in the sample sizes that we looked at that they were really having uh, more morbidity in the feed yard or uh, were stressed or, or had, uh, had more injury or anything like that so I guess the biggest message I can send from all of the research that we've done and we over the years we've probably done 10 to 15 different studies and from those studies I can say the most valuable piece of information and it's very practical is the condition of the animal loaded onto the trailer is the biggest thing that dictates the outcome of that animal coming off the trailer so if you make a poor loading decision you can't compensate uh, for anything you do in terms of that transport, whether it's reducing the duration, uh, you know, weather conditions, any of those things, loading density, don't have as large of an impact on the outcome of those animals after as the condition going on to the trailer. In Canada, we do have transportation regulations. Um, those are, uh, you know, specified by our Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So I believe the U.S. has some regulation. There is some there is enforcement of those regulations, so um, we really monitor those things. Um, there has been quite a bit of, like I said, the industry has funded quite a bit of work, and so even as part of our beef codes of practice, the values or the cutoffs that I'm, some of the research that uh, I've shown you, and where, you know, what transport distance should be, um, or time on truck, what loading density should be, are actually based upon scientific information rather than anecdotal evidence or research from other countries that don't necessarily apply to our conditions. So we've they've done the work, they've funded the work, and they're putting some of those answers into the codes and into the regulations. Some of the detailed research that we do in looking at some some of the physiological measurements and, and also some of the behavioral measurements, we've been uh, able to automate that with devices that we can place on the animal. For example, if we want to monitor heart rate, it's important to monitor the heart rate before the animal goes on the trailer, um, and then we can measure it during the transport, and then we can measure it coming off the trailer. So. Um, when we look at that we actually have to put uh, belts around the animals and we have to shave shave them so we can put the electrodes much as what would happen if you went to the doctor to get your heart rate monitored you're fitted with the equipment we also do that with the calves we put um, uh, those devices on the calves like I said 24 hours before they go on transport so we can get some baseline information as to what their heart rate looks like when they're not stressed then we put the the belts and everything on they go on to the trailer. So what we did see with that data was that initially um, was part starting the trip and we think it's just basically from loading and unloading. So their heart rate really increases during loading. It's a very stressful process. Then the animals come on to the trailer. Once they kind of settle into the journey and it, as long as the journey isn't, you know, there, there's not excessively poor driving or really bad weather conditions, we do see that the heart rate really settles down and is, uh, you know, stays very close to baseline and the rest of the trip is not a problem. So it's one of the indicators that shows that loading and unloading can be quite stressful for those cattle. And it's one consideration we need to take into account when we're talking about increasing the number of rest stops we give them. Rest stops mean we have to unload the cattle and reload them. So I think we really have to do, we don't have much research on that, that's an area where we could focus a bit more. And it may turn out that actually more rest stops may be poorer for those animals in terms of welfare rather than feeding them on the trailer and, and on the truck which also ha raises a bunch of issues in itself but I think if we kind of look at it without those things in mind uh, it will help us to the next steps.
We're just in the middle of a very large um, a study funded by the Beef Cattle Research Council, so the Canadian Cattlemen's have funded it, uh, and it's looking at the age of castration. So if you look into the literature, there's very little um, to show that, you know, doing these procedures earlier as how we perceive that they should be done, there's nothing actually saying that. When we went to do our codes of practice, and we went to write into there, well, uh, these procedures should be done no later than this age. There was nothing in the literature that we could find in the scientific literature that actually said that. So this study is specifically looking at that, trying to determine which age is most welfare friendly, which procedure. So we're looking amongst, uh, so at zero or one week of age, within one week of age, uh, two months of age and four months of age. Um, those are the ages we're looking at and then we're looking at different procedures so band castration versus surgical castration and um, so once we determine the best age and method then we're going to apply some different pain management strategies to to further improve their welfare with those procedures and then we want to look at so we we're looking at both in a research setting and also in a commercial setting so on so on a ranch so to make sure again it's very relevant to what the pr producers are doing it's very doable it has to be easy for them to use you know we have to keep in mind all the well uh, withdrawal um, values for the drugs that we're using the combination of the drugs we're using so those things again a strategy around pain mitigation is what we're working on and we're not we're not done yet so we've just started some of that work and it's another three years before we have that work completed.